welcome class to part four of chapter 16, where thus far in chapter 16, we have discussed uh, reactions that are reversible, uh, what it means for them to be at equilibrium, as well as how we can predict in which direction a reaction will go from the start in order to reach equilibrium. Today we are going to be uh, discussing then the last quantitative piece of chapter 16 and laying this foundation, being able to understand reversible reactions, and that is how can we calculate equilibrium concentrations from the initial conditions? So we're going to be combining what we have talked about uh, in all of the previous parts, along with some of the concepts from chapter eight in order to understand how we can calculate these equilibrium concentrations or pressures uh, after initial conditions have been let loose to reach equilibrium. Okay, so now that we have a way to predict which direction your equilibrium uh, is going or your reversible reaction is going to shift all depending on how close or far away you are from equilibrium. Uh, let's, let's tie in the idea of being able to calculate equilibrium concentrations if you know initial concentrations. Right, so this type of process we're going to talk about using ICE tables, which I'll, I'll lay out this acronym in a second, because uh, yes, ICE in this case is an acronym. Uh, the kind of parallel to previous conversations we've had uh, that have to do with stoichiometry is before we would start with a limiting reactant, right? So let's, let's do a colon here, limiting reactant. And from your limiting reactant, you could get some type of theoretical yield. So that's sort of like what we are going to be learning now, only it's going to be a stoichiometric process for reversible reactions. Again, looking at a limiting reactant and a theoretical yield, as we've learned before, does not work for this case. Since these reactions are reversible, there is no limiting reactant. There is no theoretical yield, as we have previously talked about. So we're going to have to learn a new way to calculate uh, what is the end state going to look like? What are these equilibrium concentrations going to be equal to? So here's where we're going to introduce the concept of an ice table. Now you might have learned a different version of this in high school, or you've never seen it before, or uh, you've learned how to calculate equilibrium concentrations without uh, something called an ice table. All of those things are totally fine. This is the method that works best for me, and this is what I am going to be passing on to you guys. I would definitely encourage you to read through the textbook though, find uh, like not necessarily alternate uh, means to calculate equilibrium concentrations because I don't want you guys to have to be spinning your wheels on something you don't necessarily need to know or might be incorrect. Um, but if this seems very strange and foreign to you, what I am going to encourage you to do is get practice under your belt. Practice, practice, practice. With practice, this type of problem will go faster and will become easier. All right, so let's lay out how to perform this type of calculation. So we're going to use this ice table to calculate our equilibrium concentrations of reactants and products if we know the initial conditions and a Kc or Kp or whatever type of equilibrium constant that we are working with. So the I in the ice table stands for our initial conditions. Right, this is our starting point. This is like the starting point on our treasure map. Our change or our C is going to represent the change, whether or not your reaction is going to be not shit. Let's say spontaneous. We'll, we'll keep the language consistent. If it's going to be spontaneous in the forward or reverse. So we're going to be using the concept of our Q or our Delta G to figure out what is the change of the reaction. This is going to tell us the progression of the reaction as it continues. And eventually we will hit X marks the spot, which is what E stands for. This is going to be uh, equal to our equilibrium conditions. And I want to keep uh, the language general with the word conditions, since we could be working with pressures, uh, both initial pressures and equilibrium pressures. This process is going to work mathematically the same way. So the best way to learn this method that we're going to lay out, where we're going to use our initial conditions, observe some type of change and calculate equilibrium conditions, because so far we haven't seen anything too remarkable, uh, the best way to learn, in my opinion in this case, is to do. So we are going to do an ice table problem. We are going to lay out the method that we are going to be using to solve for equilibrium conditions for reversible reactions. So what is 
or what will the equilibrium concentrations be for the following reaction, both reactants and products, provided that we know the initial conditions uh, where we have an initial concentration of H2 that's equal to 0.1, an initial concentration of I2 that is equal to 0.2, and an initial uh, concentration of HI equal to also 0.1. So in this type, uh, or in this example problem, we're going to be starting with both reactants and products uh, and this work is going to be, uh, I guess the best way to say it is the most complicated version of this problem. There are simplifications. We will talk about the simplifications afterward, but if you know how to follow the most detailed steps for the hardest problem, you will be able to extrapolate and figure out how to solve the easier problems much, much more easily instead of having to build up to this because the process is going to look the exact same for every problem. So the way to start, here we have our reversible reaction, our H2 uh, being added to our I2, reacting reversibly to give us two HI. And here's the equilibrium constant, Kc, presented. We can see it's equal to 45.9, meaning that we have a pretty equal balance between reactant and product uh, in this reversible reaction. So where we're going to start, we're going to lay out what we know, our initial conditions. So our initial concentration for H2 uh, is 0 0.1 molar. Our initial concentration for I2 is 0 0.2 molar, and our initial concentration for HI is 0 0.1 molar. So notice that I'm just laying out these uh, concentrations right underneath the reactants and products in our chemical equation. We're treating this almost like a table, right? The, the header is up above, and our uh, row labels are going to tell us what we're filling in. Well, the next row label is the C. This is the change that we're going to expect to see which means that we need to figure out in which direction is this uh, reaction going to shift. So our very first step in solving for what the equilibrium concentrations is, uh, will end up being is to figure out what is our Q. Since we have an equilibrium constant K, we can compare Q to K to figure out which direction is the reaction going to shift. Is it going to move spontaneously in the forward direction to create more product? or is it going to move spontaneously in the reverse direction to create more reactant? So let's set up our Q. Our Q is going to be equal to, and again, we're setting this up in the exact same way that we set up uh, the expression for the equilibrium constant. It's just now we're using the initial conditions. We don't know if we're at equilibrium. I mean, hey, if our Q ends up being equal to 45.9, problem's done. Um, I'm sure you could tell though by my preface into this problem, that is not going to end up being the case. So the uh, concentration for our HI is going to be squared since we have a 2 in our equilibrium uh, re uh, reversible reaction here. Concentration of H2 is going to be multiplied by concentration of I2 in the denominator. Uh, plugging in the values that we have, our concentration of HI we can see initially is a 0 0.1 molar, and this is going to be squared. We will divide this all by 0 0.1 molar times 0 0.2 molar. What this ends up equaling, this gives us a K or a Q that is equal to, hold on, where'd my mouse go? Down here, there we go, 0 0.5. Now this value for Q is definitely less than our value for K. Q is less than K. Now, since Q is less than K, what this tells us is that uh, we don't have enough product. We have too much reactant. And because we have too much reactant, our reaction is going to shift or react spontaneously in the forward direction. We are going to be losing reactant and we are going to be gaining product. Now, the exact amount of this loss, we do not know but we can figure it out. The change uh, that we can predict so far, we are going to be losing reactant, hence why there are these negative signs here, and we are going to be gaining our product, hence why there's a plus sign here. The exact change, since it is an unknown, we are going to leave as a value of x. We are going to lose a certain amount of reactant where the change or loss of both of the reactants is going to be equivalent since we have a one-to-one -one balance in our reactants. However, as the reactants react and we end up generating product, we will gain twice as much product for every unit of change that the reactants make since we have an expo or not exponent, a coefficient of two in front of our HI here. So this coefficient of two is what ends up getting plugged right in front of this X. 
So what this tells us is that at equilibrium, we will end up with a 0.1 minus X molar solution uh, or collection of this H2 gas. We will have a 0.2 minus X molar uh, you know, collection or sample of this I2, and we will have a 0.1 plus 2X sample of our HI. So all I've done is added up each of these columns where 0.1 minus X gives us this equilibrium concentration for the H2. The 0.2, our initial condition, minus the change of X is gonna give us the 0.2 minus X, and our 0.1 molar plus 2X gives us this 0.1 plus 2X down below. Now, in uh, at, at first glance, it would appear as though like, okay, well, what do I do with this information? I didn't really solve for what the equilibrium concentrations are equal to because I still have this unknown of X here. But what we have now is an equation that we can set up based on equilibrium conditions. Since we know our equilibrium constant is 45.9, and if we were to set up an equilibrium expression where our equilibrium concentrations get plugged in here, well, we can see that we have one equation and one unknown, and that one unknown is the X. If we can solve for X, then we can solve explicitly for what the change is going to be from initial to equilibrium. And therefore, we can solve for the equilibrium concentrations directly if we can find X. Okay, so I have set up this kind of blank slide I'm gonna be working on. Uh, we're just following up from the same work, but I want to be able to like flash backwards to it if I need it. So let's set up our equilibrium expression. Our equilibrium expression is going to be equal to concentration of product HI squared at equilibrium, right? That's the defining feature of K versus C. Now we are going to assume that we are at equilibrium. The change has occurred from our initial conditions to give us a stable, reversible reaction. The H2 concentration at equilibrium will be multiplied by the I2 concentration at equilibrium. And we may not know what the exact equilibrium concentrations are, but we do know initial plus the change for the product, where X again is that unknown change. We know 0.1 minus X for the reactant H2 and 0.2 minus X for the reactant I2. And all of this is gonna be equal to 45.9. So here now we have that equation that I had mentioned, this one equation based on equilibrium, knowing or hypothesizing what our concentration change is gonna be and setting that equal to what we know our equilibrium constant is equal to, 45.9. So from here, it's just a matter of algebraically rearranging and solving for x. So I'm not going to show every step, but I will show some of the steps, kind of setting up this problem. First, we're going to take the denominator and multiply it up into the numerator on the other side. So we will end up with a 0.1 plus 2x squared. This will be equal to 45.9 times 0.1 minus x times 0.2 minus x. All right, the next step afterwards uh, to solve for x, right, because the goal is we want to get x on one side and all of the rest of the numbers on the other side. So let's set up the left-hand side of the equation into something that we can work with to actually solve for x. We are going to set this up uh, since the squared here just means that we're taking the same thing in the squared twice, multiplying it together. We're going to take 0.1 plus 2x, multiply it by 0.1 plus 2x. And all of this is going to be equal to what was previously on the right-hand side, 0.1 minus x, 0.2 minus x. So from here, what we can do is, uh, if you heard this acronym in high school, awesome. If not, then what we are going to do is the process of foiling. So we're going to uh, combine these like multiple terms here. So we're going to take the first term, whoop, multiply it by the first term here, plus the first uh, term by the second term, plus the second term by the first term, and the second term by the second term. And what this ends up giving us uh, for the left-hand side is a 0 0.01 plus 0.4x plus 4x squared. This is going to be equal to uh, 45.9 times, we're going to do the same thing for this uh, term on, or these two terms that are being multiplied on the right-hand side. First, outside, inside, 
and last, the process known as foiling. So we're gonna add all of these terms up as well. That'll give us a 0 0.02 minus 0.3x plus x squared. So here now we have nearly uh, set up this equation to solve for x and the goal, uh, right, is going to isolate x. Well, we can't just straightforwardly isolate x since we have some squared terms here. What we're gonna actually end up doing is setting up a quadratic equation instead. So if we pull everything to one hand side of the equation, leaving only a zero on the other, what this leaves us with or sets us up to solve for is a 41.9 x squared minus 14.17 x plus 0 0.908. And all of this is equal, whoop, equal to zero. All right, so just to recap what we've done so far, we set up our equilibrium expression so that we can solve for x. We started rearranging uh, to try and isolate x, but because we ended up with these quadratic terms, right, this square, even though we still have an x that just has an exponent of one, the way to solve for x then here is to set up a quadratic. In other words, we are going to be using the quadratic formula formula to be able to solve for x here. Now, if you haven't written this down yet, or if you want to perform more of the algebraic steps in between, definitely pause the video because I am about to erase everything. So I still have a blank sheet to be working with. All right, but I will rewrite what we just had 41.9 x squared minus 14.17 x plus 0 0.908, and all of this is equal to zero. So the quadratic equation is going to allow us, so long as our equation is written in this form where we have some ax squared plus bx plus c, all equal to zero, uh, what this is going to enable us to do is use the quadratic equation, which is uh, a means to solve for x, so long as your equation is set up like a quadratic, uh, where your x is gonna be equal to negative b, plus or minus square root of b squared minus 4ac, all divided by 2a. So for anyone who graduated from high school, glad that algebra was behind you and thinking you would never see the quadratic equation again, I am sorry. We are going to be using this not as much as what chapter 15 initially would uh, have you believe, but we are going to be getting lots of practice with this just in case you need to use it. So our b in this case is going to be equal to 14.7, our a is equal to 41.9, and our c is equal to uh, 0.908. And we can take each of these numbers, plug them into our quadratic equation. What this gives us though, be, uh, due to the nature of this plus minus term, are two different solutions for x. We have the positive solution, if you were to add the terms together, and we have the negative solution if we were to subtract the terms from one another. All right, so the first term is a 0 0.252, and the second term, or the second solution, is the 0 0.086. Well, now you have two solutions, both of which seem to be reasonable numbers. How do you know which solution is right? Well, the easiest way to figure that out is to go back and remind ourselves what we were solving for in the first place. We were solving for concentration of H2 at equilibrium, concentration for I2 at equilibrium, and concentration for HI at equilibrium. And the first equation was a 0 0.1 minus X. Well, all we have to do now is observe our two solutions and ask the question, which one of these two gives us a reasonable answer? The first solution, the 0 0.252, if we were to plug that in for x, would give us a negative concentration, which doesn't make any sense in the context of reversible reactions. Negative signs here don't tell us direction. A negative concentration is meaningless. What that tells us is that our first solution, where we added the components together, in this case, yes, mathematically is a solution, but conceptually here is nonsense. The actual solution the meaningful solution to us, physically and practically speaking, is the 0 0.086 concentration. So if our x is equal to that, well, now we have an actual way to calculate at equilibrium what our concentrations are equal to. 0 0.1 minus 0 0.086 
gives us a value of 0.014 molar. Similarly, the iodine concentration, which was a 0.2 minus x, when we take our solution of the 0.2 and plug in uh, the x value that we just solved, 0.2 minus the 0.086, gives us a value of 0.114 molar. And finally, our product concentration was a 0.1 plus 2x. So here we can take the 0.1, we're going to add 2 times our solution for x, the 0.086. And this gives us a value of 0.272 molar. So here now we have used ice tables laying out our initial conditions, predicting our change, uh, and using that in combination with the equilibrium expression and k, we can find what our equilibrium concentrations for this reversible reaction are equal to. And again, this problem, uh, this example problem goes through all of the steps. There are shortcuts. If you notice algebraic shortcuts, for instance, uh, definitely you are free to mathematically take those shortcuts. Uh, if you can take a square root earlier, if you can combine things to solve for x easier, by all means, go for it. If you can solve for x, Right, solving for our x value here is the goal because once we know x, we can calculate the equilibrium concentrations using x. Uh, another way though that we can uh, take a shortcut is going to be the next example. And it takes a little bit of like critical thinking to recognize when this shortcut is available. But if you kind of take a pause while performing these calculations, uh, it should not be uh, too like hard to miss this shortcut. All right, so let's look at the most common simplification to solving an ice table problem that we are going to be using. And so the simplification is very simply this. If your K, your equilibrium constant, is sufficiently smaller than your initial conditions, you can drop the minus X step. Not all of the changes, but like the difference in initial conditions specifically. So let's look at uh, what first sufficiently smaller means. So there are a couple of different ways that I've actually seen this being described using either percent differences or uh, like multiple scalar differences. What we are going to uh, use is our definition for sufficiently smaller, because this I think is the one that works the most consistently at the general chemistry level, is if your equilibrium constant K is at least 1000 times smaller than initial conditions. All right, so if your K is at least a thousand times smaller than initial conditions, we are going to be able to skip this drop minus X step. And I will lay out exactly where that comes into play in a second. So let's look at this second uh, you know, example problem. So we're starting with reactant. We have uh, 2.4 atmospheres of it. Here we're looking at a KP. So, uh, you know, just the slightly different situation where we're looking at pressures instead of concentrations. But again, the math all works out the exact same way. Now we don't have any product. We have zero of our carbon monoxide, zero of our chlorine. So what this tells us without even having to calculate a Q is that our reaction is going to have to spontaneously shift from reactants to products, right? We have no product. And if we have no product, there's no way that the reaction could shift backwards. There's no way we could create more reactant from nothing. So since we are going to be shifting from left to right, what this tells us is that we are going to be losing some certain amount of our reactant and we are going to be gaining some whoop, certain amount of our product. Now the certain amount of our product that is going to be generated or reactant lost, whatever our value of X is, again, we do not quite know but we can find it. So let's set up, uh, how do we find what this concentration is equal to? Well, we can already see that we've simplified our journey once already without even having to explicitly label it, right? Our change step, if we have zero of a product or zero of a reactant, the reaction is going to spontaneously move in the direction to fill that gap. Uh, so check, we've already figured out change. Equilibrium therefore is going to be 2.40 atmospheres minus X for the reactant and plus X for both of these products. Now, before setting up any type of complicated mathematic calculation, let's observe our K. 
Now we can see that our k here is very, very small, right? 10 to the negative 10. Our question, is this k at least 1,000 times smaller than the initial condition that we are presented with? And the answer here is most definitely yes. It is a like it is over a billion times smaller than the initial condition. Our k, 10 to the negative 10, is so much smaller than this 2.4 atmospheres. What this is telling us is that any change that could occur is going to be on this magnitude, uh, or uh, you know, like is going to be of a small magnitude, so small compared to the the initial conditions that with significant figures, our final answer at equilibrium, uh, our concentration of the COCl2, COCl2 at equilibrium is going to be approximately equal to uh, 2.40 atmospheres. In other words, this change X is proportional to what our equilibrium constant is. And the smaller our equilibrium constant, the smaller this minus X is going to be relative to the initial conditions. Therefore, this minus X we can drop. This is the X that I uh, mentioned earlier that we are allowed to drop up here where I said drop minus X, this is the one that we are allowed to drop. Any change from the initial conditions, if this K is significantly small, it doesn't matter. Our equilibrium condition is going to be basically what we started with because we started with so much, right? It's like taking a pile of 1 trillion marbles and taking one marble away and you're like, there, I've made a significant difference. You haven't, you still basically have at eyeball, one trillion marbles. So that's what we're doing here. We are removing this minus X because the change is so insignificant. All right, so this is actually going to simplify our work a lot. So the way that we are going to simplify our work or how this has simplified our work, we can set up our equilibrium expression, our KP, which we have the value it's equal to, is going to be equal to the partial pressure of CO times the partial pressure of Cl2, all divided by the partial pressure of COCl2. Now you realize I said pressure or uh, concentration over here. This should have been pressure. But the point still remains that the change is going to be so insignificant that our partial pressure will still end up being 2.40 atmospheres. So our K, our equilibrium constant expression, is going to be approximately equal to the partial pressure of our CO at equilibrium times the partial pressure of Cl2, all divided by 2.40 atmospheres. There. Uh, the partial pressures that we're going to be inserting here are the values at equilibrium, which we can see from our table are just values of X plus X. And the reason why we don't drop these X's here is because we are, let's see, do not drop, because we are changing from nothing, right? We have moved from zero, a number which signifies that you have nothing, to a number which signifies that you have something. This is, regardless as to how small the change is, a significant change. And for that reason, we do not drop these plus x's on the product side. So the x's are going to remain in the numerator, giving us an x squared, since we're taking x times x all divided by 2.40. And this is gonna be equal to our equilibrium constant, that 2.2 times 10 to the negative 10. Now, if we rearrange and solve this equation, it's gonna be very easy to solve for x, right? We multiply the 2.4 up onto this side, and then we can take the square root of both of our numbers. That's way easier than trying to rearrange our equation into a quadratic and then use the quadratic formula to solve for x our x is going to be equal to equal to 2.3 times 10 to the negative fifth atmospheres. So this gives us what our change is, what our x is equal to. And again, if we come up and observe our initial concentration or our initial pressure, partial pressure of the COCl2, 2.40 minus a number that is times 10 to the negative fifth with rounding two significant figures is still gonna be equal to 2.40. So this atmosphere at equilibrium for the COCl2 has not changed. However, we do have a partial pressure now, both for the chlorine and for the carbon monoxide, both values being equal to X, 
which we just solved for. So now we can see that there is a slight shift from reactant to product, that slight shift giving us 2.3 times 10 to the negative fifth atmospheres of each of our products, whilst also simultaneously not really shifting that much away from the reactant due to the very small nature of our Kp. And this is going to be where we call it a day. At least this is the only like new concept we're introducing today. Uh, there are a few additional example problems that I will be working through after the end card or after the uh, like outro title screen thing. Um, if you'd like to see some extra work and get some extra practice with being able to solve for equilibrium conditions or concentrations after you know the initial <laughs> conditions uh, as well as the equilibrium constant, um, or some other ways, you know, just to like look at this type of problem. So if you would like to see that extra practice, I would definitely encourage you to stick around after the uh, like outro slide uh, after that <laughs> little like, thanks for watching. See you later. Um, but yeah, if you have any questions in the meantime, please do not hesitate to let me know. Uh, if you have any homework, please do your homework and uh, class is dismissed for those who don't want to stick around. class welcome to the bonus video for solving ice table types of problems how do we work with the balance between initial conditions equilibrium constants and equilibrium conditions all right so we're going to work through two bonus problems here the first problem is uh laid out below we have a reversible reaction which is listed here chlorine is interacting with bromine reversibly to create two uh mono bromo or chlor or bromo bromo monochloride Wow, it's been a while since we've had to name compounds, BRCL. Uh, we have a sample that is one molar Cl2 is being mixed with a one molar sample of Br2. What are the equilibrium concentrations at 500 Kelvin where our equilibrium constant is equal to 0.031? Okay, so this is going to be a pretty straightforward example problem where we're going to lay out our I, C, E, or ice table. Uh, we can fill in the gaps already with what we know just from the wording of the problem. So we are told that we have a one molar sample of chlorine and a one molar sample of bromine, meaning that we can put in a one molar sample here under the chlorine, a one molar sample here under the bromine. Now we are told that the reaction begins when Cl2 and Br2 are being mixed together. There is no mention of BrCl being present initially. So it's safe to assume that we have nothing, no BrCl to start with. Okay, so if we wanna predict a change then, which direction is the reaction gonna spontaneously move? Well, the first thing that we can notice is that we have zero moles, zero molar product uh, initially. Now this means that the reaction is gonna have to shift in the direction to actually create product, right? We physically can't go backwards. We cannot create reactants from literally nothing. So we're gonna to have to go from reactant to product here, meaning that our change is going to be minus X, minus X uh, for each of the chlorine and bromines, just minus one X since we have stoichiometric coefficients of one in front of them. And on the product side, because we have a stoichiometric coefficient of two, we're gonna be adding two pieces of change, two units of change, two X's for every one shift away from the reactants. So yes, we're not doing total stoichiometry here, but the stoichiometric balance is still going to matter somewhat. So what this means is that we're going to have uh, at equilibrium a 1.0 minus X concentration for Cl2, a 1.0 minus X concentration for Br2, and a 2X concentration for BrCl. All right, so now that we have some equilibrium information. We also have an equilibrium constant here. We can write out an equation much to, uh, or much in the same vein as what we did in the example problems from lecture. So we have a Kc here, uh, our equilibrium constant, which is going to be equal to the concentration of BrCl squared. Again, we have a coefficient of two, meaning we have to square uh, the concentration of the BrCl. And we are going to, in the denominator, have our reactants multiplied together, the concentration of Cl2 times the concentration of Br2. 
Now we have some equilibrium values that we can actually insert into the equation from our ice table here, whatever our partial changes are going to be. So we have a 2x squared uh, in the numerator, right? 2x coming from the table. We still have to square it since the square is in the equation. So we have a 2x squared. Uh, in the denominator, we have a 1 minus x. And yes, this is 1.0 if we want to keep sig figs, but I also want to save on some space. So I'm going to shorthand this with just a 1 minus x. Okay, so from here, uh, since we do have a value for what kc is equal to, right, we know that kc is equal to 0.031, we can insert that number here on the left-hand side, and we can go about solving the problem using a quadratic equation, etc., etc. However, in the main lecture, I'd also mentioned that if you spot any type of algebraic shortcuts, absolutely use them. Use any type of shortcut that you can find. And here, before moving forwards, if we kind of take a, a beat, take a moment to inspect the equation as we have it laid out, we can actually see that there is an algebraic shortcut here that's going to save us a lot of time. Now, our equilibrium constant, again, is 0 0.031. And the equation as it is on the right-hand side, well, there's not really a way to shorthand what the numerator is. This is still 2x squared. The denominator, though, notice that we're taking the same thing, 1 minus x, and multiplying it by itself, right? 1 minus x. This is the same thing as 1 minus x squared. And if it isn't immediately obvious how that has helped us, let me show you. We now have a squared in the numerator and a squared in the denominator. This is the same thing as if we were to pull that squared out of the entire fraction. And here now we can see that we have one big thing squared. And in order to remove a square, algebraically speaking, like, yes, we can distribute the square as we could have done, go through the quadratic equation. But the easiest way to get rid of a square is just to take the square root of both sides. And now we have completely removed the square from the problem. The square root of 0 0.031 is equal to 2x divided by 1 minus x. And now we have a very simple way to algebraically rearrange and solve for x. And in fact, if we do so, we find that our x is equal to 0 0.0809. Right, so this uh, algebraic shortcut saved on a lot of time. Um, we don't have to go through rearrange a quadratic equation. We don't have to use the quadratic formula. It is just a straightforward rearrange and solve for x. Push x to uh, the left-hand side of the equation, push all the numbers to the right, and we end up finding that x is equal to 0 0.0809. Now this value can be used then back in the equilibrium row of our equilibrium table. If we take 1 minus x, we're taking 1 minus that 0 0.0809. Uh, and what this gives us is a, an equilibrium concentration of our chlorine that is equal to 0 0.919 molar, as well as our bromine being equal to a 0 0.919 molar. Just to box these off so it's a little bit easier. And for our product, we're going to take two times what our x is, uh, which is going to be equal to a 0 0.1619 molar. There. So now we have our equilibrium concentrations, both for reactant and product, in a fraction of the time. Um, so the setup of the problem, we do the exact same way, moving these unknown x's, these unknown changes, into our overall equilibrium expression, which we wrote here. Um, up until this point is basically the same. It's at this step where we realize, oh, hey, there's a shortcut here. And so this is going to be one common type of shortcut that you can look out for. If you can cancel out your squares using a square root, that's going to save you a lot of time. Now, if you go back to the previous examples that we worked through in lecture, we actually could not utilize this shortcut at any point. Those problems were designed to be problems that we have to lay out uh, or use a different type of shortcut like the second problem we worked through where k was super, super small. This is a problem where k is not super, super small. Um, our k we can see is uh, not a thousand times smaller than our initial conditions. In fact, it's only about a hundred times smaller. So our k is not so insignificant that we can just drop change in x, but instead we found a different shortcut algebraically speaking, which is also totally mathematically valid. All right, so if you have any questions on the math uh, as I worked through here, um, definitely let me know. If uh, 
you want to take the time to kind of work through this math the long way just to show yourself that yes, your X is going to still be equal to 0 0.0809. Also get that practice. Again, practice, 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 whatever you need to really get this type of problem under your belt. Okay, so our ex uh, second example problem uh, is a little bit different, but it is a way to use ice tables to solve this type of reversible reaction problem. Uh, so let's work through this slightly more detailed problem. We can see a new way, excuse me, a new way to use these ice tables uh, in a very like effective kind of preparatory means. So, all right, second bonus problem. How many moles of our chlorine must be added to one mole of our antimony trichloride in a two liter container to reduce the amount of antimony trichloride down to 0 0.7 moles. All right, so here we're not necessarily looking for equilibrium conditions. We are looking for an unknown initial condition. How many moles of chlorine or chlorine must be added? This is, uh, phrasing that lets us know that we are looking for something pertaining to the initial conditions. So let's see how the setup of the problem is going to end up being the same, but then we're going to follow through with it in a different way. All right, this is a reversible reaction. We can see a forward backward reaction arrow here. We have a KC that is given to us, which tells us that we're still going to be setting up some type of I, C, E, or ice table. So any value that goes into an ice table, since it corresponds to the equilibrium constant, where your equilibrium constant, uh, the values that we're putting in here, our antimony pentachloride concentration, all divided by antimony trichloride concentration times chlorine concentration. The word that I've used now multiple times is concentration. The units of concentration are what matter in this KC. This KC with a subscript of C, meaning that this value right here pertains to when our uh, values for our reactants and products are all in units of concentration. So what is going to be very helpful for us is to lay out the ice table with all of the information we have in units of concentration. So our antimony trichloride, we are told that we have one mole of it to start with, and it is in a two liter container. So the concentration of our antimony trichloride initially is going to be one mole divided by two liters or 0 0.5 molar. This is the value now that we are going to enter into our ice table down below. All right, so we have a 0 0.5 molar concentration for the antimony trichloride. Our chlorine, we don't know. We don't know how many moles are being added here. We uh, do know the volume of the vessel, but its actual concentration is zero moles divided by two liters. Like we know the two liters bit, but we don't know the number of moles. So this is the first unknown that we're going to lay into this table. Now the antimony pentachloride concentration uh, is also not told to us, but in laying out kind of reading into the, the terminology of this word problem, we are told that chlorine is being added to antimony trichloride. Antimony pentachloride is not mentioned anywhere, so for much the same reason we did in the previous example, we're going to assume that there was nothing to start with. No antimony pentachloride. All right, so what this does for us is that it tells us that our reaction, again, is going to be shifting from reactants to products. We're going to be creating some amount of product in this reversible reaction. And because the stoichiometric coefficients in front of everything are one here, we're going to be losing X's on the reactant side and gaining an X on the product side. Okay, so this is going to look strange, but bear with me for a second. The 0 0.5 minus X will be our concentration for the first reactant, our uh, SBCl3. The chlorine is going to be our question mark minus X, whatever this concentration is equal to. Concentration divided by two liters. Let's just keep it super consistent here. Question mark number of moles divided by two liters is our uh, minus X is going to be our equilibrium concentration. All right, and our product, the SBCL5, will have a concentration that's just equal to X. All right, so if we were to set up an equilibrium, uh, like KC kind of problem, equilibrium constant expression, 
what we can see here is that we have our unknown x, but we have another unknown, this question mark here. And if we have one equation and two unknowns, technically we can't solve it. So what this tells us is that either we have a problem and this uh, you know, bonus problem, as I have laid out here, is unsolvable, or there's another way to solve it. So let's go to the wording of the problem and see if there's any information that we have not used. So we've used the one moles of our SBCL3. We've used the two liter container. We have not used this 0.7 moles anywhere. So let's see where this comes into play in the wording of the problem. We are looking for how much Cl2 must be added in order to reduce the amount of SBCL3, reduce the amount of SBCL3 here at equilibrium. This is kind of reading between the lines a little bit, but we want to reduce the amount and so it would make sense that this amount would be reduced when we have gotten to equilibrium. Uh, so we're looking for the equilibrium value in moles of our SBCL3 to be 0.7 moles. In other words, we are looking for this value right down here to be equal to 0.70 moles divided by 2 liters. Again, we want everything to be in units of concentration. So what we have now found is a way to solve for x without needing to use this entire expression here. We have found a way to solve for x by setting up uh, our initial conditions change, and now we are told what the equilibrium conditions for one of our pieces is going to be. All right, so our x, 0.5 minus x, is equal to, if we solve for this concentration, 0.35 molar. So now we have a means to uh, figure out what our x is equal to if we uh, subtract this uh, 0.35 to the left hand side, move the x over, we find that x is equal to 0.15 molar. And we can plug that in everywhere, right? x is x no matter where it is. So the change uh, that is happening is a minus 0.15x minus 0.15 plus 0.15 all across the board. And so the equilibrium concentration uh, for the SBCL3 here is going to be equal to the 0.35 molar. The unknown concentration uh, for the chlorine, yes, we still don't know what this question mark is right here, but we do know that we are going to be losing 0.15 molar. And the equilibrium concentration of our SBCL5 is also going to be 0.15 molar. So now we have uh, an equation that we can turn our eyes back to that has, you know, this one equation and only one unknown. And this one unknown this time is going to be the concentration or the molar value for the chlorine at equilibrium. We're not necessarily solving for x since we just solved for x. We're looking for something else now. So if we set up our equilibrium uh, expression, uh, let's set up these lines here. We have a 5.65 that is equal to 0.15 molar. Again, our equilibrium concentration for the SBCL5 we just found. This is going to be divided by a 0.35 molar, which is from the uh, antimony trichloride value right down here. And this is going to be multiplied by whatever this term is. Our question mark divided by 2 all subtracting out 0.15. That looks kind of schmooshed there. Uh, if we algebraically though rearrange and solve for what our question mark is equal to, right, since we've now set up an equation that we have the means to solve for what our question mark is, algebraically speaking, I will leave the steps to you to double check your ability to solve this type of problem. But our question mark, our number of moles, right, since that's what our question mark is, is number of moles divided by liters. Liters are going to go away. We will have a value that is equal to 0 0.452 moles. So this is how many moles of chlorine must be added initially in order to get this reaction to move a predetermined amount. If we think of this more conceptually, it's like we have a reversible reaction we know we're going to be working with, and you're shooting to get a certain amount of reactant left over. You want to still have 0.7 moles of your antimony trichloride. And the way that you're going to do that, you're going to push this reaction forward only a slight amount 
uh, by adding 0.452 uh, moles of our chlorine in this two liter vessel to get the predetermined amount of product that you want. All right, so here are some two, or here are then two example problems, uh, bonus problems that hopefully kind of seeing more of this math, how we can think about using these ice tables has been helpful to you. Uh, there are definitely more problems that we are going to be working through. Basically for the rest of the, of the semester, we are going to be doing these types of reversible reaction problems. So we're gonna be getting plenty of practice, but the more practice you get sooner, the easier it will be as we progress into uh, the more difficult concepts. Um, so yeah, again, let me know if you have any questions, um, but otherwise, thanks for watching this little bonus video. Again, I hope it was helpful. And